Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to another edition of Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy. I'm Dave Kelso. We're here with Richard Hamilton, and we're speaking with Patrick Doyle of Veritas Counseling on the importance of mental health, providing you, our viewers, with a free online virtual visit of sorts to his digital couch. Patrick has a very reliable consulting style that draws upon his personal experience as much as his professional training. He has over 25 years experience in therapeutic counseling. He's been the assistant director for Genesis and something I'm not sure how to pronounce, A-S-A-N-T-E, -A um, Health Systems Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center. He has been on the board of directors for Southern Oregon Drug Awareness and assisted in several domestic violence task forces and treatment programs in Jackson and Josephine counties. He is a pastor, a television and radio talk show host, and a guest speaker for countless seminars and retreats. Pat is married with two young adult sons. His popular television and radio show covers a range of controversial topics, and all the rest of the information is available at his website and so on and so forth. Um, the main topic for today is going to be talking about the racket scam and otherwise scumbaggery within uh, Big Pharma and getting um, you know the scoop from a professional in the field because obviously I'm not in his career field, neither is Rick, so best to know than somebody who's actually had years of experience. Mm -hmm. So, Patrick, you are on the soapbox. Welcome to Paradigm Shift. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm really thankful that um, somebody other than me wants to talk about this. Um, as somebody who sat in an office with people um, who are on psychiatric medications for years and worked in drug and alcohol treatment agencies where we detox people off psychiatric meds for years. Um, I have a very up close and personal understanding of what happens when someone takes these meds, what happens when someone gets off these meds, and the discrepancy between what's propagated and what's actual. And uh, so, you know, I see a lot of human suffering as the result of doctors prescribing medications that they A, don't really understand what they're going to do, B, don't know what they're going to do, even if they do understand it, and C, have no idea what it's going to do when that person gets off. Uh, D, the very well-documented long-term brain damage that these medications do, they actually do no balancing. They do destruction. Um, and I would refer anybody who's interested in an expert's opinion on these things to look up Dr. Peter Bregan who has, in my mind, done the best and most um, appropriate research on this and has become an expert witness in many cases against the big pharma. And um, he is a guy who I would, if you're interested, any book that he's got about the subject, I would encourage you to read. He's got a website. But, and, uh, and, and, and for the grammatically challenged, how do you spell his name? Uh, Peter uh, Bregan is B-R-E-G-G-I-N. And um, he wrote a book that really caught my attention years ago. Uh, it was a book called Toxic Psychiatry. And in that book, he starts to delineate some of the research uh, findings that he's had and his own personal experience as a, a psychiatrist. He himself is a psychiatrist. And so sort of he became a good person to blow the whistle on his own community. And, um, you know, there are some very difficult realities that surround how the psychiatric community develops diagnoses, you know, they don't they don't have a blood test or any, you know, empirical evidence. They just make an opinion, then they write it down in the DSM four or five, and now you're that. And um, it's very different than most science. Um, so uh, I really want to come at it from the personal, um, you know, problem that it creates in the person who goes to a doctor because they're struggling. And then they get medications and their struggles worsen. And um, I, I hope it, in some way that our country can start to see this for what it is. Um, and as somebody who's walked, you know, thousands of people through difficulty, I know that there's another way. You, you don't have to be medicated. So for the uninitiated, the uh, 
the DSM stands for the Demonic uh, Sadist Manual, or what does it uh, stand for? <laughs> well, that might be one interpretation, but the, on the book it says Diagnostic Statistic Manual, 4th edition or 5th edition, and that's that's basically the psychiatric Bible. It's So all insurance companies, as soon as you come into a, and this is one of the things that I've departed from. When, when I got out of the agency world and I started my own practice, I, I decided to, to be outside of all of the insurance business because an insurance company, the first thing they want you to do as a therapist is to put a diagnosis code on a patient. Well, if somebody comes in for counseling, there's no need to diagnose them necessarily. Not everyone needs a diagnosis. However, the way the industry is set up, without a diagnosis, you don't get reimbursement. So uh, when I got into the business on my own, what I decided was I would, I would do all private pay and I would stay completely out of the insurance game because the vast majority of my early career, that was my, that was my biggest headache, is people in an insurance agency who want to validate or justify what I'm doing that don't have any counseling background. They're just bean counters. So, and then the other thing is, is that the other thing that the, the uh, insurance companies are going to require is they're going to require a certain level of documentation. Um, and having worked in the agency world for years and having sat in many court cases with a file in my hand and had a judge look at me and say, I order you to open the record. And then me opening the record and <laughs> basically a lawyer gets hold of information that a therapist wrote about their client now is used in a legal setting. I've seen people lose their parental rights. I've seen a lot of damage done by that lack of confidentiality. So when I got into my own practice, one of the other reasons why I didn't take on the insurance game was because uh, I didn't want to have to make an official record. So now if I get a court subpoena that's, you know, for my records, I don't have one. I am the record. So I'll go to court if necessary, and I'll tell you what I believe you need to know, but I get to protect the client's confidentiality because I'm not going to say something that I think is going to incriminate them. Whereas if it's a written record, your, your, the idea of confidentiality is a myth. goes out the window. Yep. Yeah, I've always kind of found it suspicious that um, they refer to it as a practice. So it's like they're practicing on us. We're, yes. we're, we're guinea yeah. pigs out here in the public. Yeah. And, you know, in medicine, most of medicine is a very exact science. It's, it's, um, it's changing all the time. There's new discoveries. So, yeah, in terms of, you know, the thing that I get concerned about is, you know, we're, what I'm really getting concerned about lately is the, is the rapid increase of young children on psychotropic medications. Um, they can do irreversible long-term brain damage. That's That's been proven. Um, and again, I would refer to you to Dr. Peter Bregan, who's done the best research on that. Um, and there's others. If you go to his website particularly, you will find other, uh, some particularly a couple of European scientists who have really done some good work on this. But, um, you know, the idea that we've been sold a bill of goods that, look, if you have mental illness, the problem is that you have a, you have a um, problem in brain chemistry. Did you realize, I don't know if you knew this, but there is no empirical evidence that any mental illness is biological. Yep, I, I totally knew about that. As a matter of fact, I think that all of the quote-unquote valid aspects of psychology actually classify more under neurology seeing as neurology actually deals with the brain, whereas yeah. the rest of it is just, you know, hocus pocus, whatever, you know, somebody's opinion is that is just, you know, taken as, you know, the law. As a matter of fact, um, a lot of, you know, you see all the, all the crazy commercials about, you know, oh, this drug is to help you with this. Side effects may include, and then this big nasty list here, and I like to tell people, those aren't the side effects. That's what the drug does. <laughs> exactly. One of my favorite side effects is anal seepage. Ew. I don't know what problem I have that requires me to have that, but <laughs> I don't want it. If your erection lasts for more than four hours, high-five your partner. 
one thing I've you may have been at a whorehouse. Um, so <laughs> the uh, the um, I know, think Rich was trying to. I think Rich was trying to say something. What were you trying okay. to say there? Rich? Oh, I was just I was just going to make the quick little side note. Um, one of the main things I've noticed with you know a lot of these big pharma mainstream pharmaceutical drugs um, you know, are the drugs that they push. You know, yeah, they may be partially designed to help treat or you know potential you know um, be a preventative for a problem, but generally all of those side effects are there. You know. I mean, they think of this stuff kind of like a science, all these different side effects that they include and add on all this stuff, you know. It just creates a plethora of other problems that then need to be diagnosed by other drugs that then they try to push and sell to you. Oh, you have this problem? Well, there's another drug to treat that that has, like, another branch of side effects that then exactly. there's another rainbow bridge of drugs to treat all those side effects. You know, it's just right. it, the, the money just trickles up with all the side effects, you know. Yeah, and I... I've, I've come to calling that the medication merry-go-round. You need one for this, and then that does this, and then you need that drug for this, and then, you know, and any, anybody who wanted to know what was really wrong with you, there's no way they could ever figure it out because you don't know whether it's the drug or some actual biological pathology. Mm -hmm. And, and so, then, you know, of, of course, to say anything that you're saying on this Hangout automatically means that you have a mental illness. Apparently, that's their attitude about it. And it's funny, most people don't realize that, you know, back in uh, the, the, the Stalin days, um, in that regime, they actually had on record that um, nonconformity to communism is a right. um, psychological mental disorder. So basically, if you yeah. don't agree with Stalin, then you've got something wrong up here. And I see America going down exactly that same road. If you don't agree with everything the government says, you have a mental disorder. And in fact, there's a name for it. It's called ODD, or Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the other thing that that bothers me in the psychiatric movement is that, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that that labeling people is very um, unloving. Uh, when you label someone, in my mind, you cease to love them, and now you've categorized them, and you've, um, you know, basically, in essence, you know, you can call it what you will, but you've prejudged them, and you cease to listen, you cease to be involved, you cease to see them for who they are. And um, so then you, you talk about, you know, when I was talking about the, the insurance world, which drives the diagnoses, and then you have someone diagnosed, okay, now that person's told this is your label, and this is your label because you have a defective brain chemistry, and the only way to deal with this is there's no hope because it's, in, it's, it's, irrevoc it's irreversible and it's lifelong, so your only hope is to take these medications that make you better for the rest of your life. But what's not being said is, A, none of those things I just said are true, and B, the medication is not going to heal anything because there's no evidence, zero evidence, remember, that any of this is biological. So then instead of actually treating the problem that the person is having, like, I don't know, maybe they're traumatized, I don't know, maybe they're in a difficult relationship, I don't know what their situation is, but, you know, I can guarantee you it's something because I've got 25 years of experience that says that's the case, and then now they, they believe they're broken. That's hope, that's hope inspiring. And that this is no, there's no way around this. You have to keep this the rest of your life. And the only way to deal with it is to be on these medications and make you a zombie. That is yeah. very loving and very kind of us to do to people. And the truth be told, dealing with these things is not easy. It's a, it is a process. It takes energy. It takes real love. And it, 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 you, you can't be uninvolved. You have to be involved in some way, and subsequently, the other thing that gets lost is these people get ex, you know, uh, moved out of the community, whatever that is, and into the special category. No one ever heals in that process. Yeah, exactly. Two quotes come to mind. Um, it is no measure of health to become well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. That's uh, one from Jiddu Krishnamurti. And um, 
The other one, I'm not sure um, which psychiatrist actually said this, but they said that um, neurological disorder is a completely understandable effect that comes from an increasingly totalitarian society. So the more you build stress on stress on stress on stress, and right. people don't, a lot of people don't realize that um, the whole idea behind, um, you know, paradigm shifting and, you know, working out these issues and addressing belief systems and so on and right. so forth, a lot of people think that it's just a lot of ideological nonsense, but there is actually a physical, neurological um, component to that because, okay, take for example, you know, things like depression. Um, depression and things like that are basically an emotional negative feedback loop. You're feeling sad about feeling sad about feeling sad about feeling sad about etc. Feeling angry about feeling angry about feeling angry about feeling angry etc. It creates a black hole, so to speak, an emotional black hole. And the way the brain works, um, the more you practice something, um, first it starts in declarative memory, which means it's not automatic, it's not integrated into the neural networks. At first you have to keep declaring it, but then once you practice at it enough, it goes into non-declarative memory, which means the neural networks are formed. So these are hardwired neural networks. And neural networks, most people don't know, can be created and dismantled. And in the meantime, you have if you're if you're trying to create a a neural network to dismantle the previous neural network for a while you have two existing in simultaneous opposition that fire at once to the same stimulus and that if anything is what is what quote unquote bipolar is but the other name is cognitive dissonance to where you're used to one mode of operation and then you've got another mode of operation simultaneous that is in direct conflict to that. But the more you practice the new behaviors, um, the, way, the way the brain works is that any behaviors that are, that are used less and less and less, the brain starts to physically discard them or deconstruct that neural network. But that doesn't happen like, you know, in a second. People expect to plant a tree seed today and have a 40-foot tree tomorrow, so to speak, because we've been we've been raised to see time as the enemy because of the totalitarian school system. Oh, you have to jump through all these hoops, homework deadlines on Friday, got to do it now, otherwise you're going to fail. You're a failure. Fail, fail, fail. So we developed these neural networks that time is the enemy, so we want everything now. And that's where all this sense of instant gratification and apathy and entitlement and all the stuff that is that is in society now comes from. But there is obviously a physical neurological component. And you're not stuck with any neural network you have. Through that process of working things out and facing things, like you said, known as paradigm shifting, you know, you can over time deconstruct the old neural network and construct a new, better one. But that process can be painful because in the meantime you've got data collision. Right. Well I will guarantee you it will be painful. No one changes because they're comfortable. And uh, you know, you know, uh, one of my favorite philosophers um, said something that I thought was pretty interesting, Francis Schaeffer, he said, people will give up all their freedom to maintain their personal affluence. And so yeah. if your goal is comfort and personal affluence, you know, no no difficulty, you know, freedom is not going to be where you're going to end up. Exactly. As a matter of fact, the funny thing is most people don't even know what comfort or comfortable actually means. All it means is that which you are used to. It's familiar territory. You know how to navigate it you feel like you're on solid ground. That that is uncomfortable is anything new, anything different, anything that you don't have previous experience for. Now, li little kids, you know, their idea of fun is always exiting their comfort zone. Oh, wow, that new thing over there. Let's go check that out. 
what's that over there? They haven't yet been taught to fear anything outside, you know, of their comfort zone. Because all uncomfortable means is it's new and I don't have any experience. So when you when you basically have the Stockholm syndrome for for your comfort zone, then diving into anything new feels like being pushed out of a plane without a parachute. It feels like a complete loss of control, even if the new thing is something very simple. No big deal. You know what I mean? They, there's still this terror, you know, that comes with it for people that are locked into the Stockholm syndrome. Because societal Stockholm syndrome is exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the other aspect of that is that I, I find that people who know that they're valuable and loved and secure, um, as with little children, mo you know, a lot of little children are very secure because someone is caring for them. They, they don't have to worry about anything, so they are much more free to explore. And as an adult, what I've seen is people who have a strong sense of value um, that's like at a, it's beyond an emotional, intellectual level. It's like, uh, I don't know, spiritual uh, for lack of a better term, something that's beyond your um, ability to understand. You know that you have value and that you're secure. Those are the people that I see that do the most transforming and live the freest lives because they're not controlled, like you were saying before, by fear or their, you know, their fear of losing comfort or their fear of having trouble. But in fact, they are actually free to experience or try whatever because they know, irrespective of what happens, they're going to be all right. So their circumstances and future is their their reality is not circumstantially based, and I see it all the time with people who their circumstances are basically the fulcrum with which they are living on. So if our circumstances are good, then everything's great. If the circumstances are bad, and again, circumstances are bad based on what my filter of things. Um, exactly. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten, and people don't realize they're they're putting themselves in, into a constant self-fulfilling prophecy. I think the other thing that I see, though, um, and particularly as it relates to you know the psychiatric medications, I see many people who who in their in their soul, in their gut, in their in their knower, whatever, they know that this isn't working. They know that the medication isn't working. Uh, but they feel trapped. They don't. They don't. They they have no idea that there's another option. And certainly, their doctor or the medical community isn't saying to them, you know, <clears throat> it's it's a rare occasion that uh, a person on these meds is told, well, why don't you explore some therapy? Um, and so, it's tragic to me that people feel in, in this trapped way. They have no way out. And you know. Um, it, you know, it's really a pretty significant lie that's been told to them about who they are. And to me, that is, that is just flat wrong. Um, you could probably put yeah. some other words on that, something that wasn't broadcast, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty irritated by that, and I, I've spent much of my life trying to reverse that process. Um, but, you know, even Dr. Bregan, who's on a national level, he, <laughs> he gets ridiculed on a regular basis. Oh yeah, Which, I'm sure. You know, it's uh, you know, it's just how it is. So it doesn't deter me. I'm still going to do what I think is right. I'm still going to keep doing what I'm doing because there are a lot of people that can be be helped. But I don't know that we're ever going to actually overturn the whole thing without its collapse. And with you, oh, you're it's, talking about it's, it's going to collapse because, as you as you already know, um, <clears throat> the more things change the more things change exponentially. It's always slow up the hill. But when you get to the top of the hill and you're going down the other side, it, gravity you know, kind of takes you down and forward. And right now we are in a process of you know, human collective paradigm shift, whether you want to relate it to quantum physics, esoterics, biblical prophecy, whichever, whichever you know, platform you want, to, you want to consider it under, we are in such a rapid state of acceleration that the only thing that can survive it is anything with integrity because anything without integrity is like a house of cards. If you take a house of cards and you build it on the hood of a car and then you start driving that car forward, obviously, you know, what's going to happen to that house of cards? It's cards. It's playing cards. It's going to blow right off and just go all over the place. Um, as far as faith, 
I like to say that everybody, and I mean everybody, has 100% faith. The question is, faith in what? Do you have faith in misery? Do you have faith in difficulty? Do you have faith in suffering? Or do you have faith in things that might actually benefit you? Because mm. people think that having faith in things that will benefit you is wishful thinking, but it's actually not. It's not it's not blind faith. People people see faith and it's like, oh, faith is blind. No, it doesn't have to be. If you have faith in the fact that your two working legs actually work, then you're going to act in the direction of that faith and you're going to get up out of your chair and walk. But even if your two legs work perfectly fine, if you have a belief system that says they don't, then you're going to sit in that chair going, oh, woe is me, I wish I could walk. And if anybody comes up and says, you know, your legs work fine, why don't you just get out of the chair? They can no, 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 they, they don't. They're, they're broken. I wish someone would fix them. Even if ten doctors examine and go, oh, your legs are perfectly fine. No, 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 they're not. They're not. If someone has a belief system, people always act in the direction of belief systems. I also always tend to say the facts of any matter are irrelevant because people always act in the direction of their belief systems. And even if a belief system is total bunk, all actions have consequences, very real consequences. So if you take action based on a horseshit belief system, the consequences are going to be very unpleasant. But belief systems tend to disguise themselves as facts in people's heads from their paradigms. So if a belief system is having these nasty consequences but people think it's a fact, then you try to tell them, well, just change your belief and act in a different direction, you're going to sound to them like you're suggesting sprouting wings and flying. Well, and I've just learned from, you know, lots of experience, Dave and Richard, that, you know, change is a difficult process. And it requires a lot of um, care. And when I say care, I don't mean, um, you know, easy care. I mean, like, being care full of care for someone um, to help them navigate those difficulties. Because like you're explaining, there are many there are many barriers to our transformation. And if you look at history, you just see it so over and over and over and over again how you know change has been resisted uh, every time uh, and so my hope is that you know in the process that of having the discussion we can get people to at least ask the question you know uh, maybe cause a seed of doubt about the foregone conclusion that the pharmaceutical industries are telling you the truth because the fact is they're lying through their teeth and there's evidence of that, and they've suppressed it, and suppressed it, and suppressed it, and um, subsequently, many, many, many people have died as a result yeah. of those lies. And um, Remind, reminds me of a particular Bible for, verse. I can't remember the book and chapter or whatever, but it says um, something to the effect of um, to to any in the pursuit of condemnation without investigation uh, such a fool will suffer their folly or something to that effect yeah yeah and so you know the you know like when you were talking about before like just <laughs> one of the things that has dumbfounded me in, in a just like in amazement is the the effectiveness of the pharmaceutical ad campaign that basically took an abject lie and made it gospel truth. Well, that, I'm going that, to, I'm go, I'm going to use a, a Hitler quote as to the, the effectiveness. Um, tell a lie, make it as big as possible, and tell it frequently, and eventually yeah. the masses will believe it is true. Yeah, but, but they were they were touting false science mm -hmm. to validate their lie, and that that's the other thing that that just bothers me is that, you know, psychiatrists are supposed to be carrying people with a scientific understanding. And Hitler, Hitler the did that too. They're the purveyors of the lie. Mm -hmm. And they're getting paid for it. 
I mean, psychiatrists don't even learn how to do therapy anymore. They're just med management. Um, so you go and you pay 200, 300, whatever bucks for 15 minutes for, you know, to get your medication adjusted. They don't, they have no concept of what the context of your life is, what's going on, what your stress levels are, who's in your life, what you believe, what you think. They don't know any of that because all they believe is that if I give them this medication, they'll be magically better. But if that's the case, why don't people get better? Yeah, well, no kidding. Thing, what? Why aren't thing. the peace levels changing? What's kind of what's kind of really interesting to me is, you know, we're already beginning to see, you know, really dangerous side effects of that system because, you know, you look in the news a lot more recently lately with pharmaceuticals and psychotropic drugs and you look at all these mass shooters and stuff that have gone to schools and taken out their rage on people and killed, you know, innocent people. Now, whether or not, you know, there's all kinds of different theories and different uh, possibilities behind, you know, how those guys got guns and, you know, who, it was there people within the government that were, you know, setting them up to do that, you know. Except, regardless of how, those people were still... Regardless of how, yeah, those people were, you know, they were products of the pharmaceutical industry, and, you know, you look into the background history of some of those guys, you know, they were all on a on a regimen of pills, you know, for depression and anxiety and all these different other symptoms that, like you said, you know, they paid $300, $400 for 15 minutes to go sit down in an office somewhere and have some guy write on a yellow notepad what his symptoms were and then say, and then go to the little prescription, you know, uh, form or whatever, scribble his name on there for whatever medication out of the book and go, you know, rip it off and give it to him and go, here you go, you know. And unfortunately, you know, that lack of attention, that lack of care, you know, that that belief system of, oh, here's what's wrong with you, here's what's going to treat you, and then, oh, you come to find out that drug isn't going to treat you. And, you know, unfortunately, right. it just leads to this destructive path until the person inside the, you know, the genuine person that probably just needs some help and some guidance and, you know, right. a pat on the back that, you know, if you start today and, you know, work to make yourself better every day, you'll be all right. Unfortunately, that person on on the inside snaps and they yep. get this ludicrous crazy idea to go kill a senator or you know shoot a bunch of kids in an elementary school or go to a, a theater and a you know to a movie premiere or you know go down to a university campus somewhere because they believe that nobody loves them and nobody cares about them when in reality there's probably plenty of people that would love them and care about them but they're they're they've been taught to believe the cycle of neurosis the cycle of of, you know, I'm weak, I'm pathetic, I'm, I'm stupid. It's something that I see Stockholm so syndrome. often. It, yeah, total Stockholm Syndrome. You know, it's something that I see so often now, you know. Mm -hmm. I see so many people going through it. It's just, you know, it's yeah. sad, but, you know, it, it's... You know, the other, the other thing I want to make sure we mention here is that the other thing that's important to note here is that the psychotropic medications also create suicidal and homicidal ideation oh, by, yeah. their mm -hmm. by their manipulation of the brain chemistry there have been many cases one because the evidence is so overwhelming that it was the medication that created the very symptom it's given to treat mm -hmm. and yeah. that, that's why on the medication when you try to get off the medication like benzodiazepines for example your Xanaxes and the anti-anxiety meds their main side effect of withdrawal is severe anxiety. So you take the medication for anxiety, you try to get off it, your anxiety goes up, you think you're still sick, but really it's the withdrawal of the medication, which the doctor is not going to tell you that it has a withdrawal factor. Most doctors total, don't know. Total scam, total scam. Yeah. One thing I was going to say earlier is that even Hitler scientists figured out that there's no particular race or type of person that has any particular genetic um, uh, propensity for any particular type of behavior or what have you. But right. the whole Aryan race thing was a really great um, psychological uh, weapon because what their ultimate goal was, and it's the same goal that is still out there by the psychopaths in control of this world, is population reduction 
because um, the smaller population you have and the more whacked out of their minds they are, they're easier to control and psychopaths are always all about control. Um, as far as the stuff you were saying about, you know, um, sh you know, people shifting out of their problems through, you know, addressing it instead of, you know, going on all these all these meds that are just going to totally, you know, fuck up their brains, make them suicidal, so on and so right. forth. Right. Is that um, you can't change what you don't own, and in the state, in the Stockholm syndrome state. People are not owning their own emotions. They're seeing um, their own emotions as some sort of etheric external boogeyman that's hiding behind the bush, waiting to jump out at them and attack them. They, they're they're totally externalizing their own emotions. Because one thing that that I mean, and for me myself personally, um, the quickest way to not be sad is to let yourself be sad. You end the negative feedback loop. The quickest way to calm down from anger is let yourself be really pissed off. You end the negative feedback loop. You're owning your emotions. You're saying, I have the right to feel this way. Granted, I don't like the way I'm feeling, but I'm feeling it and I have the right to because you can't change what you don't own. If you don't own it, then it's this etheric boogeyman, this ghostly boogeyman that you can't stop. And it keeps coming at you, coming at you, validating the victimization mentality so you can keep pointing at it and go, see, there it is, it keeps happening, I can't do anything about it, I am a victim. Plus, yeah. there is a, a chemical component that most people don't understand too, and I've talked about this as well, but for the uninitiated, I know I'm about to say everything you already know, but for the uninitiated, there's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And for every emotion you've ever and never felt, there is a neuropeptide. And the body, being like a biological computer, for every emotion, there is an electrical frequency, just like when you hit the keys on the keyboard, only with these electrical frequencies, it tells the hypothalamus which neuropeptide to release into the bloodstream so that you're literally feeling the emotion in your body. And things like stress hormones are incredibly corrosive, so corrosive in fact that they use synthetic stress hormone in anti-organ rejection medications so that, so to, to cripple your immune system so that the body doesn't start attacking the new organ. It gives the body time to, to accept that organ. And the news and everything else, we are being pumped with 24-7 freaking fear. Plus, the corrosive um, neuropeptides, they have their own withdrawal symptoms, too. As a matter of fact, the reason that people can have heroin addictions and cocaine addictions and things like that is because those chemicals are close enough in makeup to the corresponding neuropeptides that the cell lets it in because it fits into the freaking receptor. Mm. So we literally have chemical withdrawal as soon as we start to feel happy, people are addicted to drama. So that's why as soon as they start feeling confident, sure of themselves, happy, they, they go do something self-sabotaging and destructive in order to get those previous corrosive neural peptides flowing again. Just like how a crack addict won't pay their rent, won't buy food, will abandon their family, do all of these destructive things just to get the money to get their neck fixed, fixed in order to avoid the pain of the withdrawal symptoms. This is literally what's going on. You know this already. I know this, but I'm just saying it for you know whoever might be watching. I know I'm preaching to the choir with both of you. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think that you know, it's funny to me that many of the people that I have had the privilege of working with come with an already predetermined, what I would call self-destructive value statement of themselves. Um, you, you used other language. Um, but they believe they're, they're defective, they're less than, they're not good enough, they're worthless, you know, whatever. And there's lots of reasons why that's been 
the case. There are very real experiences that that person experienced, and either they were real injustices or perceived injustices, but either way, now they're the person, so they're real, right? That self-destructive value system is the very thing that then makes the, the drug addiction seem okay because, hey, I'm a worthless piece of junk anyway. Might as well act like that. So when I see somebody behaving in a self-destructive manner, I know they always have a belief structure that says, I'm worthless. Okay, so then you go to the doctor, the psychiatrist, and you have this belief structure, so you're struggling with whatever, depression, anxiety, whatever, and he says, yep, pretty much you're defective, so here's this medication, good luck. <laughs> now the thing that was supposed to help you just confirmed the very lie that's destroying you. Tragic. Yeah, exactly. And another reason that that happens is because our current school system is based on the, the the Prussian model and in the Prussian model which which was the model that Nazi Germany used by the way was to eliminate critical thinking and to completely conform to blind obedience because if you can think critically and you've gone through a school system to build up the neural networks to think critically then you can say to yourself okay I feel worthless I believe this and that and blah 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 but is it true I think it's true I feel that it's true everything I see on my external validates that it's true but am I missing something is there data that I'm missing that can disprove this? Because just like any valid science, real science, not the pseudoscience that the science community has turned into, but real science tries to simultaneously prove and disprove everything they encounter to see which happens. Um, science has pretty much become the pursuit of funding through ego. So it's all about being right. And because it's also, it's, become, it's also become a religion. Yeah, Einstein warned us of that. Don't let science become yep. a religion. And yep. because a, a a particular scientific view becomes an industry with shareholders and profit margins and so on and so forth, now the perpetuation of obsolete data is a profitable market, which means new data is a threat to that market mm -hmm. right yeah and you know the tragedy is that you know it, it, particularly from my point of view the psychiatric industry becoming profit oriented instead of people oriented um, you know and I think it's happened across the spectrum in medicine is that you know the dollar is more important than the person sitting in the office which is why I'm only going to give them 15 minutes instead of actually something that can be helpful and so, you know, when the whole system is set up to devalue the person, well, we're going to have a giant mess. And that's what I see over and over again is that, you know, the system is not working. And, and don't get me started on the mental health system because, you know, there's another tragedy in our, cult, in our culture. There, and I would refer you to a, to a good book if you're interested. It's called Mad in America. And it's about the mental health system of America and what we do to people that are supposedly mad and uh, how inhumanely we've dealt with it over the centuries and we're not yeah. much you know farther along now um, we like to tell ourselves we are but not really so we've just outsourced it to medication and zombified people and you know so they don't have to be dealt with but um, yeah. you know that that whole you know message system of you know you're not worth anything you're you know the dollars more important no one ever says that but everybody experiences that yeah, I mean, one one thing that I tell people, whether or not you're talking about governmental systems or medical systems or psychiatric systems or whatever, when they're intertwined. Yeah, when people start to realize that these things might not be quite right, they always say, "Oh my God, these systems are broken," and I tell them, "Here's some food for thought." What if these systems are actually working perfectly, 
you've just been lied to about what they are designed to do. What if yeah. these the systems are not designed to help you? What if they are designed to bend you over and fit a redwood tree? <laughs> <laughs> what if that's what they're actually designed yeah. to do? You only perceive these systems as broken because you don't understand what they are actually designed to do. Now, when you see that these systems are designed to screw you over, you see that these systems actually work perfectly. You look around at society, you see how things are, and you see that they are working perfectly. They are actually doing what they are designed to do. You know, it's really tragic too because you know, I, I again, I just I live in the end of the pool where I'm I'm picking up pieces all the time of circumstances and situations with people, and um, you know, I see so much of it is completely avoidable. Um, you know, particularly to the level that many of these tragedies happen. Um, but you know, and I, if we if we if we digressed from the political or the governmental uh, or the medical systems, and we we moved into family systems, you have a whole other situation there where there are family systems that are actually designed to harm. I don't you know I don't know that anybody sat down and designed it that way, but regardless of how it got that way. That's mm -hmm. the way it operates. So the family system, which is geared to nurture and to grow and to enable, becomes the thing that destroys. Not, to, men not, not, to, not to mention, even, even beyond family systems, just the idea of genuine, valid relationships. Like, if you're an yeah. orphan with no right. family whatsoever, but you have a sincere, genuine caring, honest to God, support group of people around you, then that's your family. It doesn't have to be blood. You don't have to have the same blood running through you. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's funny because years ago I read some research that um, guys that went to Vietnam that came like from abusive, abusive homes did really well in combat mm -hmm. and came home and did horrible. But guys who came from good families and were cared for went to combat and did horribly and came back and did well. <laughs> because the system that they lived in for the guys that were abused taught them how to have the skills to, 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 um, to you know, block things out, to disassociate, to mm -hmm. handle trauma. The guy that didn't live in that home he was traumatized when he went to war. The guy who was mm -hmm. traumatized as a kid, oh, I get this. But when they come home, that's where the difference is. And it's, to your point, Dave, which is that they were cared about. And that was the difference in how they did uh, after return. Do they have relationships that are meaningful and loving? And I, I don't mean, when I say meaningful, I don't mean perfect. I mean healthy. Um, and, you know, I just see that as a, that's a microcosm of what you see all the time in various ways. Yeah, I I totally and completely agree with you. And another problem I think is because our educational system has been designed around the uh, the the Prussian model, and when you mix that in with politics, it creates a belief system that. Um, one of our uh, odds. Oh, I, I think it was uh, uh, Thomas Reed, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, from back in the 1800s. Um, he said he warned against the idea of people thinking that um, that um, legislation is some sort of magic talisman against crime. How often do we hear people say, "Well, there's no way that." Criminals could be doing that because it's illegal. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. they those corporations couldn't get away with that. The CEOs right. would be put in with jail, enough, and the corporation enough, would be with, being taken to court. And with enough money, you know, it, it's it's incredible, you know. 
These are the same corporations that pass all kinds of sorts of laws every day that protect them, you know, through the ear, you know. And everybody right. acts like, you know, unfortunately we're in a state of history right now where the U.S. Constitution is getting, you know, completely raped daily. But, you know, everybody acts... I mean, not that the Constitution isn't a strong document, it isn't a founding document, it, does, it isn't not good principles. They're all very good principles that this nation is the embodiment of, but the problem is people have been so um, psychologically washed into it's it's unbreakable, it can't be broken, it can't be you know manipulated, twisted, turned, and they totally mm -hmm. use that to their advantage. The pharmaceutical companies, the, the insurance industry, the you know, yep. the central banks, all the way up to the top. They're twisting rules and laws mm -hmm. every day, and when you try to do the same thing, they'll throw your ass in jail for 20 to life and throw away the key and not even think right. about it. You know? Yeah, not, knowledge is not power. Practical application of knowledge is power. So, yeah, the Constitution is a great document, but what's a document? It's knowledge. Without yeah. application of knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. what you put out, you get back. It's not only a law of quantum physics, it's practical. If you put nothing into something, expect to get back exactly what you put into it. You put nothing into it, expect absolutely nothing back. Hey, fellas, I, I got to get on the road here. I got another appointment to get to. Anything else we want to discuss before I got to roll? Um... Oh, w w one other thing I was going to say before I forget to say it okay. is that one thing one thing that I've I've noticed in this society and I mean I can I can speak for myself that you know on, on this as well you know coming from my own experiences sure. because things keep getting so intense with all of this psychosis and things unraveling um, people eventually reach what I've referred to as a fuck it point and people are going to take one of two roads when they hit this fuck it point. Either yeah. desper desperation is going to breed genius and they're going to say okay, I surrender. My mind is open. I am open to any other thing that I had not been open to before because I'm completely yeah. sick of the way things have been. Or the other road is complete and total self-destruction. And if somebody is bent on destroying themselves, there's nothing you could do to save them. All you can do is steer clear of them when the nuke drops. Otherwise, you're going to get caught in the blast. I I I agree. I agree, and I I um I've often thought of you know since we're talking about the pharmaceutical companies, I wanted to make a drug, and I wanted to call it fuck it all. <laughs> oh, I've 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 used the fuck it all and, and damn it all re references before. Um, so there's something once I, take the drug, I just don't care. So just fuck it all. I don't care, and then I'm then I'm happy, right? But your point is very well taken. I think that's true, Dave. That and and you know I, I see this all the time that the the desperation or the inspiration, depending on what happens, leads people to the point of enter, entering my office. It's either the pain is so great. That they 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 have to do something, and there and there's a you what you've talk, what you talked about there is there's a very clear point there where somebody decides or um, gives in however you want to put it to I'm going to change I'm going to look for something different I'm going to take the risk I'm going to expend the energy or they just go ah screw it or fuck it and then off they go into whatever self destruction and here's the other thing I would say. I've seen a lot of people be self-destructive in good ways. They do things... Oh, yeah, it's, like, called, it's, called, it's called benign narcissism. Yeah, so in one of the ways I've seen it most hideous is in religion. Um, mm -hmm. People becoming highly religious as a way to become better, but in that process they don't become better, they become worse, um, and their pathology steepens, but now they're using God as their uh, justifying rule. And, um, it reminds so, me of the of the philosophy. I forgot if it was Plato or who it was that said it. They said, "You fight what you become. So instead of fighting the old, build the new." 
In other words, change the environment so that the old is no longer compatible with the world. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'll send I'll send you a link on this later. Obviously, not going to go okay. into it now. But I made um, a fake drug commercial parody just to be funny. Oh, and I and the wait. name and the name I chose for the drug is Obeitol Apicetamine. <laughs> 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 well, I can't wait to enjoy that with, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I will get a great ha a well, kick out of that. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, 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 I'll be yeah. Patrick. I'll, 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 send you the, I'll send you the link over Skype later. You okay. Won't be, you won't be disappointed, Patrick. It's a, it's a really, okay. it's a really good one. It's funny. And yeah, which, it, by it the way, just, you, have it, you have it just on a file somewhere? Is it on YouTube? It, what, yeah, it's on, it's on YouTube. I'll just, I'll send but, you the link. It's on YouTube. Okay. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you guys talking about this. I appreciate you inviting me on, and maybe in the future we can do some more. Oh, absolutely. And uh, just so the viewing audience knows, um, the reason you, you can't see Patrick is for some reason because Mac killed his computer's inner child. The, the Google plugin <laughs> would not install properly, so I'm, I'm using the um, Skype to Google Hangout uh, hardware gateway bridge that I've set up here. Otherwise, you would be able to see him, but Google said fail. We'll get it. We'll get it regulated next time. Yeah, we'll 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 fi we'll figure it out. Hit it with a hammer or something. Um, I heard Max make for good door stops. Then. <laughs> I'll watch it now. <laughs> I'll have to send him. I'll have to send you the Mac killed my inner child video. And for everybody else uh, watching, go into YouTube and just do a search for the keywords "Mac killed my inner child." You'll find the video guaranteed. I'll find it. I'll look forward to it. All right. Well, um, thanks for joining us. Definitely look sure. forward to to more at some point. And I hope that everybody who watches this um, takes you seriously. But hey, don't believe Patrick. Don't disbelieve Patrick. Engage critical thinking. Do your own research. Yes. Come to your own conclusions. If you follow the establishment or follow Patrick, it's still following. You're still a sheep. Don't be a sheep. Think critically. Draw your own conclusions. Ask lots of questions. Right. Live free. Yep. And don't die hard. Yeah. Hey. Hey, see you later, Richard. Yep. See you, Patrick. Catch you later. Catch you later, right. Patrick. Bye. Yep. Later. That was good. So, any any final thoughts on, on anything? Well, I didn't, I didn't really say as much as I thought I was going to say. I've been mainly listening because you guys have been throwing good points back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I've been doing most, mostly listening and, you know, just pondering what you guys are saying. And, you know, anything that I could really add or throw in has already been said for me, either by proxy of you or by Patrick. So, you know, yeah, I don't really... You know, I feel that everything that has needed to be discussed in this discussion or, you know, this part one discussion, if you want to call it that, has been discussed, concluded, you know, followed through with plenty of, you know, talk back and forth. And, um, yeah. you know. Katerina Chatter is going to love this guy. I, I hope next time we have him on, I hope that, um, I hope Katerina can, you know, be on with us because I really think she'll enjoy talking with Patrick. Mm-hmm. I think Daphne would like him too. I actually think I think Kristen would like him too. Mm -hmm. I, hey, I think everybody would like this guy. <laughs> no, from uh, personal experience, you know, in my own background, he's a he's very uh, he attacks things logically, you know, discusses things logically, you know, broadens perspectives, you know, and that's always. Uh, Oh, what's the direct quote? Let me find it. Washington. It was one of the founding fathers who said this, and it's very true. And this kind of has psychological implications. Yeah, on he's 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 not a malignant twasis that um you know goes posting attack journals in DV, DeviantArt rooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
paradigm shift spam, paradigm shift is a narcissist, paradigm shift is a pedophile. All because I had the audacity of not agreeing with someone on everybody. Oh, I did not bow to the gods of blind obedience. I've committed the ultimate blasphemy, so that makes me everything horrible and bad because I have blasphemed as a heretic against the ego of the psychopaths. Mm, where is it? Shame on me. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Famous quotes. It's one of the founding fathers who said it. Do, 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 Precisely. Do, there are so many good quotes do, 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 by the founding fathers. You gotta go to the It's just absolutely amazing. Do, 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 I'm sorry, you didn't state your answer in the form of a question. Maybe it was Thomas Jefferson. I'm sorry, WTF does not count as a question. <laughs> if worst comes to worst, paraphrase. Okay. Yeah, anyway, it was one of the founding fathers and it was mainly reflecting on the importance of surrounding yourself with high and sober spirits, you know, surrounding yourself mm -hmm. with like-minded people that will support your goals and aspirations, you know, of essentially forming mutual relationships with others, you know. Um, and Patrick is one of those kind of people, you know. He's uh, very relatable. He's been, you know, to a lot of countries. He's seen a lot of places, you know. He's been on the rock bottom, you know, many times. He's been there, he's done that, he knows how things work in the real world, you know, and he's very relatable with people and where they're coming from, you know, and he's, he can spot, you know, a fake personality from, you know, a mile away, you know, and he yeah. can spot genuine real people just like that, you know. So, yeah, no. Uh, Patrick said, between Patrick and you, you guys pretty much summed up anything that I could have possibly thrown into the discussion or, you know, besides what little I <clears throat> contributed this time around, you know, and we, we pretty much summed up everything that needed to be said at this point in time. So I don't really feel I have anything else to add, but, you know, that he's, he's one of those good sober spirits that, you know, the Founding Fathers talk about. Yep, and I think before we end this, um, one second. I'm going to, once I can pull it up here, Ah, there we go. Um, I'm, I'm going to disengage my headphones and I'm going to play Obey It All Apathetamine. Here it comes. I was to exhibit very inappropriate behavior, and all of my friends and family were extremely concerned for my well-being. I asked questions. I didn't blindly obey what I was told. I had unpatriotic treasonous notions such as freedom, sovereignty, solidarity, and equality. 
I just wasn't being the productive, mindless zombie drone that society needed me to be. I went to a psychologist and found out that there was hope for me yet. I was diagnosed with deficit disorder. D-E-C-I-C-T, or Discernment, Empathetic, Compassionate, Individuality, Critical Thinking Disorder. The doctor told me there is no cure. However, there is a prescription medication that I could take to help make the burden of my disease more manageable. Clinically tested, Obeitol Apicetamine. Please consult your doctor before you try Obeitol Apicetamine. Side effects may include sudden catastrophic implosion of your kidneys, rapid development of brain cancer, permanent spinal paralysis, erectile dysfunction, liver rotting, severe mental retardation, excruciating insufferable pain, and in some cases, very slow and agonizing death has occurred. Thanks to prescription obeitol apathetamine, I have become the narrow-minded, self-absorbed, apathetic, psychotic, vain, narcissistic sociopath, mindless sheep that government, religion, and corporate entities require me to be. Now I can live a normal life, getting fat, eating GMOs, drinking fluoridated water, and watching useless garbage on TV. I never tell you common cross through it. Rich, you do realize you're muted. Yeah, just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I think we can probably end on that note. So, thanks everybody for watching, and I'm sure we'll have Patrick back on again. Have a good day, morning, night, whatever it is on your part of the planet. Catch you later.